quantitative account of agents and their actions using the causal framework of integrated information theory. I want to start with the obvious question, what is an agent? And not as a definition, but just as a trivial statement, agents are open systems that dynamically and informationally interact with the environment. So that should be just trivially true, but it already raises at least two important questions. And one is, how do we distinguish an agent from its environment? Because um, biology typically takes agents or what uh, organisms for, for granted and given, whereas physics has a hard time to distinguish entities within a larger dynamical system. Um, and the second question is, how do we distinguish autonomous actions from mere reflexes? And um, once in, um, so we can have an autonomous system performing the same action, for example, clicking um, a right button as um, a machine that might be just um, performing the action in an automatic manner. But also um, within an autonomous system, we can have uh, the same action either performed autonomously or as a reflex. For example, um, a right click um, of the button can be elicited by a uh, strong magnetic, magnetic pulse to your, to your brain. And um, in both cases, if we ask what was the cause for clicking right, at a mechanistic level, the answer could be, well, neurons were activated and interacted with other neurons and then triggered a motor response. So how can we distinguish autonomous actions from um, mere reflexes at a mechanistic level? And here I want to give a minimal working definition of what an agent is, what an autom autonomous agent is. Um, it's twofold. One, it needs to be an open system with stable, uh, self-defined and self-maintained causal borders. And two, it has to have the capacity to perform actions that are at least partially caused from within. And the question is, can we quantify this in any way? And um, there has been uh, a lot of recent work um, about this, and many of the people are here that are interested in this kind of topic. Um, I want to emphasize uh, the causal part in my definition, and I also want to make a distinction between um, what I call extrinsic versus intrinsic information. And here, um, so a lot of uh, proposed definitions are from the field of information theory, and that is usually about correlations. So I can, for example, correlate the sensory inputs of an agent with its motor responses and make predictions about its next actions. Or I can take the sensory inputs plus the current state of the system to make predictions about its next system state. But um, whenever I have a correlation between the system and something in the environment, that information is necessarily extrinsic. It's not, um, it's not restricted to what is inside the agent, uh, what is um, a property of the, of the system. So um, the information that I'm concerned about is intrinsic information. And um, so we fix the environment, we just look at our candidate system and we ask how do the elements of this system, um, what information do they have about the past and future of all the other um, parts in the system. And uh, this information is causal because we're using perturbations to, um, to identify the information. So um, this uh, connects to what Sh Sean was talking about in Judea Pearl's work. We use um, system perturbations. We have a causal model that is the uh, directed acyclic graph. And we look at what um, my system being in its current state can say about its causes and its effect. And um, this is the type of information that integrated information theory is based on. And as many of you know, IAT is a theory, is conceived as a theory of consciousness, but it also provides a um, causal formalism to unfold the cause effect structure of the system. And um, the reason is that for IAT, an experience is identical to the unfolded cause effect structure of a physical substrate. So not to the physical substrate itself, but to the way in which all the parts of the system um, constrain the rest of the system in causal terms. 
So this structure is intrinsic because it's just about the mechanisms of the system itself. It is um, informational in the sense that I just explained. It's about the causes and effects within the system. It's uh, irreducible as the cause effect structure exists to the extent that it cannot be um, partitioned. And it also is uh, definite and it defines um, borders. So we want to find the set of elements as a physical substrate that forms a maximum of, of integrated information. And in this way, we can use the causal framework of IIT to identify the self-defined causal borders as maxima of integrated information. So here I have a very small um, toy system of interacting mechanisms, um, small neural network. These are just logic gates that are interacting. And I can take all the subsets of the system and calculate the integrated information of the system. And um, for this particular system, in its particular state, uh, I find a maximum of A, B, and C. So A, B, and C are causally interacting with D, but adding D to my, um, to my system would actually decrease the, um, the irreducibility of the system, the, the integrated information. So the, um, the borders here are self-defined in the sense that adding or subtracting a node to this uh, system of ABC would necessarily decrease its amount of integrated information. And in this way, I can use the, um, I can use phi, uh, the integrated information to quantify whether a system has uh, stable or self and self-defined, self-maintained causal borders. Um, if I have this candidate system, ABC, the way that phi is calculated, I'm not gonna go into any details because it's, it's a bit complicated, um, but basically I check for every element so A, B, and C, what are the causes at the potential causes at T minus one, and what are the potential effects at T plus one within the system? I do that for the elements within the system, but also for all the combination of elements. So A, B together might have an irreducible cause in the past and an irreducible effect. So they might do more than just A and B separately could, um, predict in this case about the future. And also ABC, and then um, the cause effect structure of the system would be all these, um, how all these mechanisms, A, A, B, A, B, C, and so on, constrain um, their causes or predict their effects and retrodict their causes within the system and how these causes and effects relate together. And um, I can use basically the same slightly adapted formalism, not as not applied to a system in its current state and what that system in its state, what information it has about its past and the future, but it can apply it to a transition within a dynamical system. So here I have the same system ABC plus some input and some output, and I know what happened at T minus one, and I know what happens now at T, and I can ask now since we're interested in actions, for example, what was the actual cause of the output of the system to be off at T, right? And so um, I can look at the previous time step and I can measure um, the causal strength with which um, the output being off determines the past. And I find the actual cause as the, um, the past, the set of elements in their past state that is most retrodicted by the, um, by the output being off. And so this is basically the point-wise mutual information for those that are um, interested in information theory, but it's not informational because what we plug into this um, equation is not observed probability distributions, but it is a perturbational uh, distribution where we set the system into all possible states. So we, we um, test what the outputs of the mechanisms would be given all possible input states. We test all counterfactuals. And um, based on that distribution, we infer what the cause of the output was at T minus one. And here it's uh, relatively simple to understand that um, the cause of the output being off in this case was element A being off at T minus one because 
um, the mechanism of the output is an AND gate. It has three inputs. So in physical terms, the light cone, the, the elements that could potentially affect it, the parents of this node are A, B, and C. But B and C are on and would have pushed the AND gate to be on, right? Only A was off, and so A was the cause for the AND gate to be on, off at state T. And this can be quantified also. Um, so this, um, so for the rest of my, my talk, I would just want to give you some examples of um, how we applied, where we applied this kind of formalism. Um, first, we um, applied the measures of integrated information to uh, the fission yeast cell cycle model and also evolved artificial agents. So there is a, a Boolean network model of the proteins in the um, fission yeast cell cycle and how they um, transition in the course of their um, biological sequence. So this network model, if it's initialized in the correct state, will go through a sequence of states that corresponds to the, the biological model of the cell cycle. And um, applying the integrated information analysis, we found that um, in all of these states, the, the cell cycle um, model, except for um, one node that just sets the, the initial state and is just an input, does form a stable um, system uh, with maximum, a maximum of integrated information throughout its cycle. This is, uh, this is not true for a functionally equivalent reduced version of the same network. So you can take this network and you can take out some of the edges and the system will still move through its biological transient. But in this reduced model, it doesn't form uh, a causal system with causal borders, meaning a maximum of integrated information throughout the cycle. And um, what that means is that uh, the nodes don't causally constrain themselves as much as they did before. And this corresponds to the fact that um, while if everything goes well, those two systems are functionally equivalent, under perturbation, the, the full model is much more robust and will still lead you to the same attractor state. So the fact that it has stable causal borders in, um, according to IIT um, and the integrated information corresponds to robustness to perturbation in the environment. Now we can apply the same analysis to um, these evolved artificial agents, which we call animates. Um, they're basically just small neural networks. They have sensors and motors and are um, kind of logic gates that interact and um, the logic functions and the connectivity of these nodes is encoded in a genome which is evolved through selection and mutation so that um, over the course of many generations, these um, agents will adapt to be able to perform a simple task. Um, for example, catching blocks of certain sizes and avoiding blocks of other sizes. And um, we tested agents evolved to this kind of task in different levels of difficulty. So um, an easy task would be to catch blocks of size one and avoid blocks of size three. And a more difficult task would be to um, ha catch size three and size six blocks and avoid size four and size five blocks. It's more difficult because you have to, these, um, these agents there have to actually count the number of, of blocks because they only have two sensors and so the blocks cannot be distinguished based on current sensory inputs, right? And we found that um, for the difficult task that uh, requires more memory and context dependent behavior, uh, these agents evolved larger and more integrated complexes. And um, what does that mean in, um, in their behavior is that um, for these integrated agents. You can see here the, the green one is the agent and um, the block is falling from above and you can see that it follows the block for a while but then it actually turns around. So here it starts following then it turns in the other direction and then it follows again. So it's not dependent on its, its just current um, sensory input but it does use its memory. But now the question is can we really, can we quantify and can we see what the causes for the actions were? And that brings us to the second part, which is um, the question of identifying the actual causes of actions. And here I want to give an example of how we can trace back the causal chain 
um, in these agents and of um, the causes of actions across various evolutionary environments. So um, what we distinguish here is, is within a system that does form an integrated entity, um, we can still have reflex actions, which would be actions that are caused, for, for example, by a sensory input um, from autonomous actions, which are, are where we can find the actual cause within large parts of, of the agent. And um, so we have an agent here, it's moving, you can see the time series of its, its brain states, and we can pick a transition and the state of its motors, for example, here, the one motor is off, the other motor is on, which would mean that it moves to the right. And um, we can ask what the actual causes were for the motor one being off, the motor two being on, and also we can see if there is a high order cause of the two being in this particular state. And again, um, the measure we use is sort of a, a point-wise mutual information between the two events. So what happened at T minus one and um, the motor state <coughs> at T, but we're using um, perturbational distributions, not the observed distribution of the system. And um, the important point is that this is a state dependent and transition dependent analysis. So we can have the same action in the same agent and may still have different causes. Um, so here we're back to the original problem. So we have a, a brain here, a bit more complicated animate. It has two sensors again, it has two motors, but the internal structure there is like 64 neurons total. And we have this state um, transition, the, the state history, and of course this is complicated and you can't really infer that much from it. So we can start at, at a given point in time and we can ask um, again, what were the causes for the motors being in their particular state, just um, the, the previous time step. And these are the, the proximal causes, so just the next, um, the parents are possible causes. But then we can also ask what were the causes of the causes. So what were the causes for the parents to be in their state? And so we move a time step back and then um, we find that this is like the next level of um, interactions and we can continue to do this um, and basically up until the beginning of time. And um, we do find though that there is a first maximum when it reaches these three nodes in this agent. And these nodes are, are outputs of the individual models that integrate the, um, the different parts of these agent, the agent's brain. So um, this means that we can take our analysis, we find the causes that are, have, are most informative about the event that happens and we find, I can go back in time and find a maximum where, where the state transition had the most um, information about its next state and then it goes down again. Okay, so um, we also did this in different evolutionary environments of different difficulty and um, the interesting part here is that just from the structure that evolved, you cannot tell that there is any difference between the agents that evolved in these environments. But um, if you do perform this causal analysis, you do find that for the task where um, only one sensor was available, the actual causes of the agents were um, more intrinsic, that means more internal nodes were evolved, so that would count as more autonomous from our um, point of view. And um, for, for both the harder task and the, so both tasks that needed more memory and more context dependency, you find longer causal traces um, with more internal involvement too. And um, so to summarize there, um, the causal framework of IIT allows you to evaluate both parts of this definition of agency that I suggested. Well, um, it allows you to identify self-defined causal borders and to trace back the actual causes of actions. And the last point I want to make is that there is uh, two important dissociations here. So we can have agents that do form an integrated entity and agents, um, oh, I wouldn't call them agents then of course, but um, so we can have systems that behave and perform well in an environment and do not form integrated um, systems. And we can also have 
an integrated agent that still performs reflexes and autonomous actions. And so that is a case we want to distinguish. And of course, IIT is a measure of consciousness. And so we can, and it does um, imply an dissociation between consciousness and intelligence. And um, I'll end with this somewhat controversial slides that we are used to agents on the middle diagonal because those are evolved agents, but we cannot really make the same conclusions about um, engineered systems that um, might not lie on this diagonal. Thank you very much.